Hi there, well. Hi, sorry, welcome to IndyCar. Slight problem connecting there. Uh, it is, what, the 18th of October today. Yesterday, the First Minister outlined uh, the first in many papers, actually, which um, describe in great detail the various things that will happen when we become independent. So this is uh, basically the, um, the SNP and Green government issuing their plans for how independence will actually happen. And the answer, or I should say Nicola Sturgeon, answers some of the major questions which unionists are constantly trotting out in their arguments against independence. One of them being the famous, but what currency will you use? Well, after the uh, British uh, parties, I think we could say, said that there was no way that Scotland would be able to use the uh, British pound if we became independent, uh, which largely means we can't have a currency union, doesn't mean we can't use the pound. But that's left us now in a situation where we must have our own currency. Now, this is something which many of us have argued right from the beginning that was an essential part of becoming independent. Why have your fiscal policy dictated by the Bank of England? Mr. Sam had very famously decided uh, to be a bit more gradualist in his approach back in 2014 and suggested that it would be in the best interest of both Scotland and England if they both shared the currency after independence. That was very quickly uh, basically ground into the dust by uh, George Osborne and his chums when they came north to deny the pound. One of the, the reasons, I think, why people lost confidence in independence was that particular strategic move. However, this new paper um, basically deals with that. There will be a Scottish pound, and interestingly, a Scottish pound would probably be worth more than the current English pound. Well, I'm calling it the English pound, the, the, the pound from the Bank of England. But we all know that the Tory government recently uh, enacted policies or announced policies which caused the value of that pound to crash. And it has taken a long time to even recover slightly, and it's hovering around about $1.11 at the moment, and very similar to parity with the euro, and very famously dipped below parity with the Asian dollar. So we know that the uh, British pound is very weak, but what would the Scottish pound do for an independent Scotland? Well, first of all, it would capitalise the country, because having a currency means we need to have our own currency issuing bank, our own version, if you like, of the Bank of England. This is a bank which would decide how much or how many Scottish pounds were in circulation in the country and uh, how they were being used to effect trade with other countries. So the Scottish pound, its value is not going to be based on uh, its ability to borrow. And the, the British state has for many years relied on the Bank of England to bankroll all of its costly decisions to keep taxes down by borrowing more and more money from its own central bank, making the Bank of England weaker and weaker as it loses capital because it's having to create currency to pay for all its already very expensive tax cuts. And that means that the Bank of England has to draw the line somewhere and eventually they're going to have to say, it probably already have said to the Chancellor, that you can't borrow any more money. It's interesting to note that since oil was discovered in the North Sea, the Norwegians have seen their wealth fund reach $2.3 trillion uh, or pounds, I can't remember which, but anyway, $2.3 trillion, I think it is. But in stark contrast to that, the British state, with all of its oil reserves in it, actually pumps more oil and gas than the rest uh, of the North Sea. It's actually got a debt which is higher than the Norwegian profit. We have a debt in the UK of £2.4 trillion. And that is, having discovered oil and benefited from it, we have actually spent all that money and a bit more in paying for tax cuts over the last few years. So Scottish currency is not going to be based on borrowing money, although it will have, the government will have the ability to borrow when it needs to. But Nicola Sturgeon outlined the fact that there would be a Scottish currency bank, a central bank will be necessary to uh, issue the currency, and that means we don't have to worry about currency unions with the failing pound. The Scottish pound has been projected to be worth at the present on an estimate uh, approximately one English pound and 12 English pence, so it's worth a bit more, or it will be, worth a little 
little bit more than the British pound when it is issued. Now people say, well, how quickly can you bring in a new currency? We're looking at the figures from across the world, and particularly Eastern Europe when various states became independent of the Soviet Union, they were establishing their currencies very quickly, anywhere from just 10 days up to about six months. And that's not very long. So if they can do it, there's no reason why Scottish Currency Issuing Bank can't do the same. It just simply has to sell gilts and bonds to overseas investors who will then invest in Scotland knowing that it is going to be a European trading country again and makes it a very attractive place to locate particularly manufacturing industries which would supply the European market. So Scotland's currency would be supported by inward investment from selling government bonds and also based on the massive amount of renewable energy available to Scotland in the future, and that is a bankable commodity right from the start. So we'd have our currency sorted out very quickly. In the time being, all the way leading up to that point, we would of course just use British pounds until we dump them. And that would happen uh, at a point when it was advised by the central bank that it was feasible to do that. And at the most propitious time, the Scottish Parliament would then vote on that uh, in Parliament and the, pound, the Scottish pound would be issued and become the first legal uh, Scottish currency in what, 317 or 18 years. So we'd be back to having Scottish pounds like we used to have before the Union started. Then we come to the thorny issue of uh, things like passports. Now, the British Unionists have been going on for years about the fact that you would need a passport to visit your granny in Scotland if you were coming up from England and vice versa. All a load of nonsense. There is a thing called the Common Travel Area which is um, in force all across the United Kingdom and Ireland, both parts of it, right as we speak now. You can travel anywhere in the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales or England without flashing a passport anywhere and that will continue after independence so nobody will have to have a passport in order to visit anybody anywhere in the UK even if you live in Scotland after independence. There will need to be customs checks made on uh, manufactured goods particularly those leaving and arriving uh, in Scotland across the border with the rest of the UK but that can be managed fairly simply with electronic systems and with uh, occasional checks of loads going through waypoints uh, and the motorways but it's not going to affect the rest of cross-border traffic especially things things like um, farm vans and things like that, where there's cross-border traffic all the time with food, that is not an issue. That can be checked as well from time to time. So the border issue is largely laid to rest as well. Not a big problem, you might think. And it wouldn't be a big problem either. Um, the whole system that the SNP has laid out has got a sequence to it. So the way in which this would happen, the way in which the pound would be created, the way in which the Scottish pound would be introduced is all phased and done in line with a whole series of um, requirements and, uh, and checks and balances which have to happen before the currency is issued. Now, interestingly, currencies are not a big problem for anyone. I remember decimalisation when we changed from pound, shillings and pence to simply pounds and pence and a decimal system. And actually, that was so easy, everybody welcomed it, especially when I was at school and didn't have to worry about shillings and halfpennies anymore, made things much more easy. Um, actually, just changing money between Scotland and England is not a big deal. And uh, Scottish pounds and English pounds can be exchanged uh, just the same way as any other currency is in, in current trading. It's not a big problem. So Scotland has the ability to do all of these things and it has the ability obviously to phase them in. But what's also promised by the SNP in these papers is the transition away from oil and gas, away from fossil fuels and towards a sustainable new uh, energy infrastructure. And they're talking about investing £20 billion over the first decade of independence. That's £2 billion a year going into the green economy and ensuring that services are provided at a level which is necessary and practice at a higher level than is necessary, ensuring people's pensions are high enough that they can lead a dignified life and have some money left over to enjoy some of life's little luxuries. So the whole thing that was hanging over Scottish independence for years, all the bugbears of the unionists had been dealt with in one fell swoop. Now the BBC covered this uh, live event when the First Minister was basically presenting this 
And as he did so, we might have thought that later in the day we would hear more of these um, these details being repeated on the BBC channels, but nobody, of course, saw any more of it than that. Once the live feed was finished, there was no more mention of it whatsoever, as far as I could see on British channels, other than Nicola Sturgeon talking away in the background with no sound and the usual BBC presenter talking over the top of her. So we know that we have this new system, this new pound coming, we will have have our own investment bank and we will have a new economic model put in place by the Scottish Government, ratified by the Scottish Parliament, which will help oil workers who are currently working in the North Sea to move away from that industry as it declines and into the renewable sector, offshore wind and offshore tide, which all use very similar subsea technology to the kind of engineering which is currently undertaken by these firms in the first place. Scotland also has to build things like its uh, its domestic defence systems as well. And what we've seen in Ukraine recently has certainly highlighted the vulnerability of our sea-based assets to things like cruise missile attacks. So that will need to take the form of another paper later on. There is always the question of nuclear weapons still hanging fire. That will no doubt be dealt with later on. However, whatever happens now, we are on course now to vote for independence one way or another. It's either going to be in a general election or it's going to be in a referendum next year. One way or the other, we will vote on it. And one truth that comes home to me all the time when I'm thinking about this is the fact that the SNP and the Green Alliance are really, at the moment, the only politicians who are capable of actually taking us to this point. At the moment, Alba does not have uh, enough MSPs or MPs to influence this very much, to be fair, at the moment. That may change with time. But one of the things that struck me is that if we are to approach this, uh, this de facto referendum as a general election aim, then we really would need to get behind the SNP Green Alliance if it, if it is formed into such a, a, a cabal as that. We would need everybody behind it, whether or not we supported the SNP or not. If we're voting for independence, we may be forced just to vote for the SNP to get that independence. I had an interesting conversation with somebody online recently who was saying or, or thought that we would do so well with our votes that the SNP might win all 59 seats and might be able to form an opposition if Labour got into power. I think, honestly, that's very, very unlikely numerically. 60 MPs in Westminster is not probably enough uh, to form an opposition. And who would they go into um, coalition with as an opposition? It maybe doesn't work. But the point of the referendum within the general election is not to win seats. It's not to take your seats even in Westminster. It's to demonstrate the vote numbers are more than 50% in favour of independence. We demonstrate that those MPs need never take their seats. They might only be necessary to be there while the negotiations take place. And the First Minister has indicated that she is open to... Um, <sighs> negotiations on the amount of debt that Scotland might agree to, but it has to be in exchange for assets or the share of assets which Scotland is entitled to. These are things which the United Kingdom owns, like um, embassies, foreign embassies, uh, different public bodies which uh, Scotland has a stake in. All of these things would need to be owned by the Scottish Government in return for taking any share of the national debt, as it's known. Personally, I don't think that will happen. I think the, the British government will hang on and will refuse uh, to share out the assets. They will make this difficult, but that's a negotiation for another time. But what's interesting about it is that um, the First Minister has left the door open to negotiations. But the plain fact of the matter is, if we get more than 50% of the vote, then we should get independence and the negotiations should be uh, started almost immediately as soon as that is demonstrated in the general election. That's going to be a hard fight incidentally to get that general election result accredited and recognised both by the United Kingdom, which is a big ask obviously, and the rest of the world. But having demonstrated that we have more support, more votes for independence parties than we do for unionist parties is a demonstration of the fact that the Scots want independence. Any majority will do, 51% will do. 
doesn't matter as long as it's more than 50%. On the other hand, we could end up just going for a referendum next year. Maybe the British government doesn't want to face us in a general election because they know what's going to happen. They might well decide that with all of the other problems that they've created for themselves, that it might be easier to cut Scotland loose and just deal with what is left of the mess that they've got themselves into. Who knows? Uh, but the nice thing about it is that we have now shut up the unionist uh, whingers who are always complaining about passports and border controls and the fact that we don't have the British pound. Who needs a pound that's tanking when you can have a strong pound which allows you to buy in stuff from outside your country at much lower cost? If your pound is strong, you can import more. OK, it affects your export costs, but then again, we have a lot of stuff that the rest of the European Union desperately needs, particularly electrical energy. There is gas as well there that could be exported. Oil revenues and gas revenues, as the First Minister rightly said, will continue to flow. We can't just switch them off and switch over to green electricity straight away. There has to be a phased and orderly change from fossil fuels to renewable energy, but still located offshore. Anyway, all of this is good news and all of the news from the other day about pensions rising and about the entire economy being forced, focused, sorry, <laughs> focused uh, on the common good, on the good of the people is a vote winner for everyone. And I think having seen the vote figure swing in our favour by 10% as soon as that was announced is a great indication that people really want this change now. We're now in a position where independence is the safe option where the, uh, the disaster that awaits us and the, um, the confusion and chaos that the Tories are creating for the, UP, for the United Kingdom, these would be our future if we stick in the Union. Whereas if we're independent, we can start our own journey. We can rejoin the European Union. We can export again. We can get inward investment. We'll become a very attractive place for inward investment if we have the opportunity to export freely to the European Union and, of course, to move through the European Union without having to flash passports. We can live and work there. We can study there. Students can exchange exchange uh, their courses there as they used to do. So many things will become possible. Research and development can be spread across the European Union. We could do so much more if we were only free of the Westminster cabal, which has caused the mess that the United Kingdom economy is in at the moment. Anyway, that's it from me today. I'll see you again tomorrow. In the meantime, keep the faith. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.